Okay, well, hello everyone again. This is Dr. David, and I'm here with Patricia McPherson, who will be talking to us about the fight or flight response. So, oh, what an important topic. How to help yourself cope with this dilemma with Patricia McPherson. And I'm going to hand this over to you, Patricia, so you can get things in place while I get your bio out and read it out. So, oh, hang on just a second. All right. Patricia McPherson is, yeah. uh, is Darwin Holistic Therapy's founder, president, and senior lecturer. She was educated or she, she was educated in Europe as a holistic healthcare professional and college level instructor. She she first visited Houston in nineteen ninety six for her daughter's wedding. A chance remark about the lack of truly certified reflexologists in the Houston area gave Patricia the vision of returning to establish a reflexology center where she could practice and teach her most favorite of therapies. And we know that that vision has been fully materialized. I will say a few more things. Patricia's enthusiasm for holistic therapies began over 20 years ago while training to become a psychiatric nurse in Wales, UK, uh, where she noticed the positive effect that vitamins had on patients and has been fascinated with, with natural health care ever since. Over the sub subsequent years, Patricia gained certification and experience in a wide range of holistic therapies, including reflexology, aromatherapy, craniosacral therapy, massage therapy, on-site massage, and anatomy and physiology. She is a lifelong learner and an excellent teacher, and what a wonderful lady! I've actually gone over to uh, Houston to be to be to have a, a session with Patricia, and I tell you what an experience that that was. So, Patricia, thank you again for joining us, and uh, I'm just excited about all the wonderful information that you have to share with us. Well, thank you, David, and thank you for that introduction. Um, we're going to talk tonight about fight or flight and as you mentioned earlier on there are so many incidents in life where we are in that mode and so I'm going to start by just saying um, I've got it. what does it mean by fight or flight what are we talking about so many people have never heard of the term some have heard it but not quite sure what it means and uh, also, what circumstances could we have that would have caused this situation where we are now fight or flight, uh, in a flight or fight mode? And how is it going to affect us? What does it do to our bodies? And what can we do to help ourselves? I hope you can see the slides that I've put up and that uh, they... All you need to do, you, you, you are about to click on it, but if you would go back to it, the bottom right and click yes. on it, there you go, click on that. All right, there. Okay. Bingo. There. So this is what we're going to be talking about, and we're going to go through it systematically and do the best I can to explain in as simple terms as possible what fight or flight is and how we can all work with it in order to be able to gain some kind of equilibrium to our bodies. Okay, stress. Uh, we all know how stress is really one of the problems in life these days, and it's becoming apparent to many, many people that sickness does not just turn up. It is a co often caused by stress-related conditions. So what happens is the body would release hormones affecting our organs, and then other activities of the body are affected too. One of the things that causes stress is danger. Now, it may not be serious danger in the sense that it's a danger because it's a car accident or anything like that. It means danger to us, danger to our person. So it could be a very relative thing. But what happens is the brain's alerted, and then the fight or flight principle comes along, comes into play, and then all our reactions of our body are affected when we're in 
severe stress and danger. So let's talk about some of the circumstances that could have us in this dilemma. So work being one of them, a very stressful situation at times. And so some of the things affecting people these days with um, in their workplace is job insecurity, short-term contracts that would give severe stress to someone who would be considering their family, how would they be able to provide for their family, and how could this affect the whole entire family in the future. Downsizing in companies are happening, and this again will result in increased workloads to individuals, the increased workloads as well as stress, worrying if they're going to be the next one to be going from the company will bring a stress condition in the body. And a lot of times people are sick, but then when they're sick, they're afraid to stay at home and recover because there's a possibility that they may lose their job. That in turn can really, can really start up a more complex and chronic condition in the body. Again, in work, a reduced training, so one would be concerned about that, thinking that the person ahead of them has a better training and would get promotion a lot before them. All these things uh, go through one's mind, getting them all disturbed and distressed, and that in a sense self will cause a fight or flight situation. And then, of course, there are times when the main breadwinner would need to move away from the family and work away from home because that is where the employment is. This can cause severe stress to the family, being without the, the mate, and all sorts of conditions and circumstances can be arisen from uh, dad being away from home, the children are now being looked after by the mum, there's no father figure, the concerns about being a split up, being away from one another would be another reason why we would have a fight or flight situation. Someone in sales, they have efficiency targets. And so what we have to think about here is that if one is using their employment as only being paid by the amount of things that they sell. So we're talking here about a situation where maybe they have not sold anything on Wednesday and they have to pay their mortgage on the Friday. Well, that in itself is going to give severe severe fight or flight situation to an individual who's faced with this. Increased traffic, well, this in itself, driving in traffic every day, maybe for an hour a day to work, an hour a day back, can give you a very stressful situation. And this is a fight or flight because they have to fight in order to get to work, and yet the traffic is causing stress. And then, of course, there's inefficient public transport where it would be a better option if they could use public transport, but they, they can't because it's not efficient enough to get them to the place of work. Then there's the age and discrimination. And so when people get to a certain point, Sometimes companies will say, well, we don't need a person in their 50s and 60s. A 30-year-old is going to be able to do the job better. That in itself is going to cause a fight and flight situation. And then you have the computerized system these days being the thing of the time. And so that means that personnel are less needed because things can be done on the computer someone in a job situation where they see this happening can see that one day they're going to be told they don't have a job and that will give them a fight or flight situation too. And then there's a failure of the top management to show a good example of leadership and integrity. Well, that can cause people to be very disturbed because they would like leadership, a good example and a certain integrity because when those things are not seen, this will cause disturbance within the person. The other things that we can face are home life, family, children, uh, caring for children, caring for their education, caring for them to be brought up in a good, reliable environment, 
animals, um, when there's animals involved, the animal sometimes becomes part of a family, and so the cat or the dog that they've absolutely loved for years is now sick, and that in itself will give you a situation where one is stressed, and of course the children who love the animals are also stressed, so mum and dad are trying to console not only the children but themselves. Then there's poor housing, and so so many times people are faced with not living in sufficient rooms, the housing is poor, the facilities are poor, this will cause a stressful situation so that they will be, uh, many people can find themselves in very, very difficult relationships because of poor housing. Personal relationships are one of the biggest things that can cause stress in a person with a fight or, fl fight or flight dilemma. That is an absolute surety. Now we can look at the environment because from the office or the work of employment to outside, we can look at things like the air conditioning, that will cause the stress, visual stress from the VDUs, the electric magnetic fields coming from office equipment, and then you've got poorly maintained photocopiers can produce, produce ozone and nitrogen dioxide, artificial lighting when someone does not see daylight in their workplace, that can be an issue. And so one would recommend that they go outside for a few minutes of time just to get some daylight, because the artificial lighting can have an effect on us. Ventilation and that being poor can really cause a circumstance in the body too. And dehumidifiers and other people smoking can be not only irritating because of the smoke-filled rooms or the smell, but because of the breathing in of other people's smoke. And then you have carbon dioxide or other fumes that come from engines and such like. So other times we can have, because of poor finance or lack of education or any of these things, our diet could be poor. And uh, as always mentioned, in any healthcare program, diet is a very important part of everyday living. And so it would be important to eat as many fresh fruits and vegetables each day, certainly six to eight glasses of water a day, and as much as possible of these things to what each person is capable and financially avail uh, they are financially available to. Some of the things that happen to us under these circumstances, uh, well, first of all, your immune system is challenged, so we would continually have colds. But there are cardiovascular disorders. We could have high blood pressure, angina, a heart attack, or even a stroke. Then there are dis digestive disorders that come from stress and the fight and flight syndrome, peptic ulcers, mucous colitis. We have respiratory disorders such as asthma and giddiness. Allergies being a huge situation. It affects your skin, affects the breathing. Muscle tensions, people would have backache, migraine, neck and shoulder pains. There's mental disorders where one has depression and then poor sleeping habits come along with it. Accidents are what we get with stress when we're extremely stressed. And ultimately, it can become cancer. One of the things I mentioned earlier on were finances. This is a huge, huge concern where relationships are involved. Financial stress is one of the main causes that can create numerous difficulties within the family. And when we think about uh, someone becoming sick, not being able to go to work in pain, then the whole of the entire family can be affected because the pain in one's back, for instance, would then create an irritated person lack of finance, every aspect of that person's relationship within the family unit will be affected, and finance being one big one that brings it back. 
So now we've got to think about how this is going to affect us. What really goes on now? So we've got the process of the reaction from our brain. This is how it works. We see the danger and the stress. The front of the brain will receive a stimulus from the eyes and the ears. They'll be aware. This is going to be aware of the danger. So your eyes and the ears are alerted. It's alerted by the brain. Now the salivary glands stop producing saliva. So if someone has ever been in a situation where they're nervous about doing something or they've got to go and give a public talk or they've gone to go on some kind of a voyage or a transportation that they're nervous of, then their glands are going to stop producing the saliva. Their mouth becomes dry, makes them very, it's very, very difficult to swallow. Then your lungs are affected because you're breathing faster because you're now in a panic mode. Your heart will pump and then your adrenals will secrete adrenaline because what they're doing is they're preparing for a fight or flight situation. Your liver is going to produce more glucose which will give you energy for your muscles. And now we've got to think about what happens to your stomach and the intestines. Because what happens is that the sphincters open. They, it causes them to open. So anyone that's waiting in a nervous situation for any given thing that might give them stress, like going on an airplane or going on a boat if they're nervous of water, anything, anything at all that will cause one to have a fight or flight situation will need to go to the bathroom because that is how it's all affected and anyone that's ever been in that situation will be able to relate to that okay this is what's happened we have the hypothalamus we have the pituitary and we have the adrenals and this all works in an axis it's a complex set of interactions between the hypothalamus pituitary gland and the adrenal glands. So if we've got this in balance and regulated, what happens is the temperature, digestion, our immune system, our moods, our sexuality and energy usage, it is all important to have this regulated. And it's a major part of our system which controls stress and the reaction to stress, the reaction to trauma, the reaction to injury. That being said, how is it all going to affect and prepare us? Fight or flight? And how will we react? Will you fight or will you fly? So we ask ourselves, what can we do? What can we do to help? What can we do to bring about some kind of equilibrium? What can we do to prevent ourselves becoming sick because of the method that has now changed our lives and the stress factor is set in? So spend at least a half an hour each day on yourself. Relax with reading, if that's what one loves, or sitting with one's feet up. And utilize your favorite pastime. It could be anything any kind of sport or anything, as long as it's something for ourselves. Practice deep breathing. We can also relax in a bath with essential oils. And then one of the relaxing and very relaxing essential oils would be lavender, but it is a choice that one can use anything that's going to bring about a relaxed state. Exercise. Have one's favorite exercise. Maybe it's swimming. Maybe it's cycling. Maybe it's walking. Maybe it's walking the dog. Any of those things can be used in order to help ourselves. Good posture is extremely important so that we're not bent over. And what if we're bent over, we are squashing and making all our organs suffer and complain because we're bent over and we're squeezing them all together. So a good posture will help us to breathe better and help us to feel better. One of the wonderful things I personally feel and believe in is a reflexology session. So if we look at what reflexology can do for us uh, with the symptoms of stress, 
we can look for things such as loosening the spine and easing the neck muscles because this would help with headaches and back pain. The picture here is showing where the spine is on the foot. Working the area would be working the nerves of the spine, the vertebrae, and the muscles. That in itself will release, release all tension in the body. And all the muscles that are tense and tight in the back would really be helped. This is an extremely important part of our body, the spine, because each vertebrae relates to a condition that may, may manifest itself when there's a problem there. It could well be that there's bacteria and viruses lying dormant in there, and working the spinal area with a reflexology session would really, really work to release that. Okay, we go back to the thalamus pituitary and the adrenal glands. This can be worked. This is a definite situation and a progression in a session that one would give as a reflexologist. The position of the hypothalamus of the foot is here right at the base of the large toenail. That can be brought to balance when it's out of sync. Then if we look here, we can think about things such as a busy mind. People can't sleep. The sleeping patterns are affected. We've got to have concentration in life. And so when we don't have the concentration, other things are affected. Constant weariness, what can happen in reflexology, and in, in reflexology sessions, it can increase the levels of energy. Working the solar plexus and the diaphragm on the feet are, are really what's involved here. And so I've put on the chart two um, spots where the solar plexus is. And the diaphragm being worked would give a lot of ease and help one breathe a lot easier. That in itself would help to relax the person, bring them back to a calm condition where the fight or flight syndrome on the situation that had brought it is now calmed down to the point of feeling in a better frame of mind. Okay. The other thing that can help us a lot is when we can clear the lymphatic system. So if we have a rigid body which would cause a cold feeling, we could help with increasing circulation. When one becomes uh, prone to the infections and illnesses that can come with a challenged immune system, this would be ideal to work the lymphatic system, building strength and more efficient lymphatic system, which in turn helps the circulation. The lymphatic system is a very, very complex system, but it's a system that can uh, does a lot of good for us. And of course, when we do with the reflexology session, we also work with the spleen. The spleen is a very important part of us, and once that's helped, then it can all bring a balance to us and really make us more efficient, give us more energy, and the things that are needed in order for these things to flow easier and freer. Some of the things that we have uh, one has when there is a fight or flight situation and a dilemma and they are really nervous about the situation or whatever they find themselves in, uh, panic attacks and hyperventilation. So relaxing the rib cage and encouraging deep breathing can be done with a reflexology session. There are times when one would need to work that diaphragm at least two or three times and the, the receiver then will calm to the point that the panic will be alleviated. There isn't a doubt that it does calm the whole of the person and then the panic attack will ease. 
there isn't a doubt that that can happen. So the other things that we do when there's a fight or flight situation or extreme stress, people have an increase in coffee or alcohol. That is something that they turn to because they don't know what else to do. And it is one of the comforters. So if one receives a reflexology session on a reasonably regular basis, then the comforters are not as needed. And also, the session is capable of removing toxins. Then one can feel isolated, they could feel inadequate. All these things do come about from a high stressed situation. And when one has and receives a reflexology session, it encourages openness and communication. The person has a one-to-one -one contact, and it is very rare that one has the opportunity of having this total one-to-one -one contact where they can be open and communicate their problems and their fears to their therapists and, and be able to talk to them freely. And these kind of things then can really, really help and a, a person to come to terms with what they're facing. Other suggestions could be make a reasonable plan for the day. We None of us can put 20 things into a day and expect 20 things to be done. And so if we do that, we make a little plan for ourselves and do the work in a diligent way, that will help us not to become over-anxious and stressed about things that we can't do. Another thing is not try to be superhuman. None of us are. And so whatever we find ourselves in, the fight or flight principle is involved with us. The reaction can be minimized by some of the presentation that I've just done and using some of the suggestions. But if we think about every emotional aspect of stress, it really does increase health problems. It really does if we do not try to alleviate it in one way or another. And these days, there's the fast pace of life causes many, many health problems, and even death from the stresses that are experienced over a prolonged period of time. So if we can remember, as it was mentioned by Dr. David in the uh, opening comments, we are all holistic in nature. Everything is involved. Our mind, our emotions, the body, and our spirituality are all playing an important part in our own well-being. We cannot take one away from the other. Everything is affected. And so taking each one, we need to think what is really happening here. One of the ways that I prove that our mind and our emotions are stronger than the body is if we have a person that's in the hospital, whether it be a husband, um, another family member, whatever, we will force ourselves to go. Our mind will make us go all the time to the hospital to visit. Emotionally, we are worrying, is he ever going to work again? Is our marriage going to to be the same, what is going to happen to the children, what about this, what about that, all the rest of the things that come with it. Our emotions are involved the entire time, but the mind will force us to keep going. It will keep us going, and afterwards, when it's all calmed down, the body will tell you what it's been going through, and so oftentimes, people that have been doing this, have been under the stress of this, their body will break down and they will suffer some kind of condition and illness that was brought about because of those two things. And so we need to remember that when we are carers or when we're in this situation, think about what is going on with the body. It's a fight or flight situation. Let's think about what we can do in order to bring some kind of peace and equilibrium into our person to make sure that things don't get out of hand. And then we can think about having a, 
a much happier, healthier, pleasant personality, and our relationships will improve. If we're aware of the stress levels that we're under, we can make up our minds that we're going to work with it and make sure that we get some kind of peace. I always remember someone saying, if we act like a porcupine, people will treat us like a porcupine. And that means if we're prickly people because of the stress levels that we're under, people will treat us like that and not come near us. Having said that, if we have got a pleasant personality, we will have a lot of people that will respond to us. And we will always then gravitate, and they will gravitate to us and make for good relationships. Hopefully this has helped to uh, show how important it is to make sure that we take notice of the dilemma of a fight or flight situation. And if there are any questions, I'd be absolutely delighted to answer any for you. Or maybe Dr. David would like to ask and mention anything that I've said. Thank you so much, Patricia. Um, um, I, I didn't interrupt at all because, I mean, this is a, you, you, you were presenting so well, and it made a lot, it made perfect sense. I mean, maybe to to me, I'm, but I'm sure some people would have some clarifying questions. But um, um, I, I, what I probably would want you to to talk about a little bit more is the the HPA access, and just kind of like tell us what goes on. Um, the role that Pitrich, I know you can work on the different parts of the foot to um, correspond with the hypothalamus and the pituitary. But could you just, uh, could you take us back to that slide again and let's, let's, uh, let's uh, dwell on that a little bit more? Please. Sure, yes. Um, I, I, you know, I really do feel that I, I need to um, do a whole workshop on discussing this and what really does happen because the amount of differences in us as people when we come to feel the, 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 the stress levels of, of this factor. Because what's really happening is the control there from the hypothalamus influenced by stress. Well, the blood levels of cortisol and, and, and how the pituitary being the master gland is affected is just one of the most amazing factors that we can think of when it comes to the stress levels. I'm trying to get back to my uh, my slide to show you that point. Um, try right clicking. Okay. That should, that should give you the op options. Um, go to slide. Actually, if you right click and then click on go to slide. Right. Go to. Then that should bring out the options. Then you can pick up which one it is. Um, I think it's what has happened. Uh -huh. yes. Now, this is what's so phenomenal to my mind. And when I do work with, with this kind of a situation on the feet, because I can do that. I can work on these things. But to think that so many different parts of us are so intertwined, releasing all these different hormones, and that lack of the balance in these will create so many things. Think about our temperature. If we have a raised temperature within the body, that means inflammation. For a start, the digestive system is affected when these are not all in balance. And then we've got our moods energy, every bit of it, and of course, what it can do as well, depression and sleep deprivation. All these things are really affected. Now, what I'm looking at here, I'm looking at the hypothalamus on the screen, the pituitary you, gland. I beg your pardon? Um, could you use that, that coloring, the, the pencil, the, the felt? Sure, sure. You know? Okay, now we're looking at the hypothalamus, then the pituitary, which is the master. The parathyroid, I know this is uh, another part of the endocrine system, 
But the parathyroid is instrumental in, the, in controlling the calcium levels in our body. When that is malfunctioning, numerous things can happen, such as kidney stones and that kind of condition. The thyroid, when the thyroid is out of balance, the difficulty one has in trying to get through a day without trauma is incredible because everything is magnified with somebody that has a thyroid condition. Everything. They can't see anything in normal terms. And that will apply to the pancreas too. So the pancreas is then affected also because all of these things are just all in line with one another. This is just the most incredible thing that's going on in our bodies. And when we talk about hormones, so many people think that what we're talking about are reproductive hormones. It's, that's not only it. Because all these other things are so highly affected. And when our adrenal glands are affected in anyone that suffers from adrenal fatigue will tell you they are continually tired, they have no energy, there is nothing coming from them, and they don't always know that it is adrenal fatigue. But when we've got the connection between how it's all going on with this hypothalamus and then the pituitary and how the, it, it, the, even the blood levels of cortisol even go through the blood and it affects the anterior part of your pituitary. That is amazing to me. But that's what happens. And again, the pituitary on the foot is the top part of the foot. And when that is out of uh, balance, you can hardly feel it. When you feel it, it becomes like the top of a match head. And so to get the balance from, I'll show you, from one to the other, you get the balance from the pituitary. I personally would work the pituitary first, and then the hypothalamus. And then I would go to the adrenals. That's what I personally would do. But when we've got all these different things going on in our bodies, well, there is no equilibrium. There is no way that one can carry on a normal life with normal relationships because they, for the start, their irritation is heightened. I'm pretty sure that when uh, most people would be aware of that, the irritation in a person is heightened when these are out of balance. I remember a lady coming to me with the problem with the hypothalamus years back. And of course, her adrenals were affected. And when we look at this uh, situation here, then we can see why. And her adrenals were badly affected. And I was working on the hypothalamus, and her surgeons were waiting to give her a kidney. And um, if the hypothalamus was not to the levels they wanted, they were going to remove that and the thyroid and give her medication. Well, as we worked on it, they, it was increasing and the figures were going up. But because she was someone who was desperate to make sure she got a kidney, she allowed them to take it out. But those figures were going up by just working the hypothalamus on the foot. And that happened years back, years and years ago. So. The, you know, fight or flight is a serious dilemma to our health. It really is. And we, unless we take control of the way that we are trying to survive the stress factors of life, we will have serious conditions. We will have, you can have diabetes, you can have arthritis, you can have cancer. Today I've heard of three people that have got Three, stage three cancer, three people today. And so all these things are because of being in stressful situations for a length of time, and they have not looked at it in that way. They have not holistically looked at it. Most of the time, people don't know the holistic aspect of it all. And this is where things like this webinar that are able to get out there to help people to understand there is much more to us than just the body functioning, the heart pumping, and the brain 
thinking and the eye seeing. It's holistic in nature, our whole framework. Does that answer you a bit there, David? Absolutely, it does. Thank you. Tell me a little bit about artificial light. Why is that a problem? Well, I don't know what the weather's like with you, but today the sky is beautiful shade of blue and the trees go tall down here in Texas and they are absolutely beautifully green. And that light and the light from the sun goes to the back of the eye and hits the brain, helps us not to have the condition sad, seasonal disorder. Now, uh, what happens with the, the, well, when we have artificial light, you see, that in itself can send off rays that are not healthy to us. What happened here? Okay. Um, and so that will have an effect. And there's some people who are continually in, uh, working in an environment without a window and with artificial light will find disturbances with the mood change and things like that. And it makes perfect sense when you think about us meant to be out in the daylight and the sunlight that really affects and hits the back of our brain so that we can enjoy healthier living. Give us energy, gives us far more energy to see the sky and the sunlight rather than artificial light. So Does it's that just, help? So it's not just about getting vitamin D for the body, it's really about the light itself. Um, does, does the light produce certain chemicals in our brain that artificial light does not? Right, 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 exactly, exactly. Okay. okay. All right, someone says, could you explain how kidney stones and trouble digesting calcium are tied to the parathyroid? Kidney stones and? And trouble digesting calcium. Oh, trouble parathyroid. digesting calcium? Um, yeah. Okay. Calcium levels are controlled by the hypothalamus. Uh, by the, sorry, I beg your pardon, by the parathyroid. And so uh, those, that in itself will, will create or can create kidney stones. Now, digesting calcium is a different thing because we are inclined to think that taking in calcium is going to help build the bone mass and that's a subject that I don't necessarily go along with but because we can build calcium in other ways, particularly getting uh, a balanced parathyroid. But um, when, if we do put too much calcium into our bodies, the parathyroid is stretched and it, it can't function efficiently. And then what does it do? There's too high a level and it produces these kidney stones. And I've seen that happen so many times. And every time somebody comes to me with kidney stones, that's the first thing I look at is the parathyroid, the calcium levels are not good mm. in that person. It may be good for somebody else, but it's not good for that particular person. And this is what's so interesting about holistic thinking, is that what one person can tolerate, another person can't. And so we can't ever say, oh, well, uh, we can all tolerate so many grams of whatever. It doesn't necessarily mean that we can because what is good for one isn't necessarily good for another. And that's what makes it much more exciting and much more personal. Much more personal. It's a personal thing when someone looks at the person in a holistic fashion. Does that help? Yes, I'm sure. It, I, well, I hope it does. Um, and if you if you still have some other if you still have another question, please send it in on that same topic. Uh, or if if it hasn't, if, if Patricia hasn't fully answered your question, huh. but that was good. I okay, think as shall. well when we think when we think about it from this point of view of the HPA axis, you know, the regulation of digestion comes into play as well. And so when those are all out of think, even with one another, then we've obviously got a situation where digestion per se is going to be affected, you know. Mm -hmm. Again, when it comes to them coming to me with that kind of a condition, I will then work the vagus nerve. 
that is another topic. The vagus nerve, huh? Oh, yeah. The vagus nerve is another major nerve that would be affecting digestion. That's interesting. Well, that, there you go, because the vagus nerve is what innervates the, the major, majority of the digestive tract, isn't it? That's right. Awesome. Interesting. Okay. Ch um, Chelsea wants to know why is, it that she, why is it good to raise your feet up? I'm assuming that's when you're asleep, when you're at rest. Raise your feet. Yeah, why is it good to raise your feet up? Why is it good to raise your feet when you're oh when you're resting? Well, a, you know, that's what saying. right? Say. Is that what she's asking? When you're resting, if you put your feet up for the day or for half an hour or something like that. Well, one of the things is sometimes blood pressure drops. That's the best way to raise your blood pressure is to raise your head, feet higher than your head. The other thing to think about is when your feet are raised up, then you are resting. Uh, you, your circulation is improving too because you, raised feet will help circulation. When we, we, it's it's just a relaxing state in the frame of mind to be in when you raise your feet up, put your feet up, and take a little rest. And that in itself is a comfort to the person. Hopefully that answered that one. <laughs> okay. Um. I can okay. This is a follow-up on the first question related to the parathyroid. I can see how it affects someone with kidney stones, but does a problem with the parathyroid affect someone from digesting calcium properly? I'm I'm not sure digesting calcium would be a, a, a like way. Maybe you mean metabolizing or absorbing calcium, but can you actually digest calcium? Well, that's probably what, what we're talking about there. What you've just said is what we're really meaning, isn't it? Right. It's, a probably, oh. it's too loose a term, really. Right. But um, absorption is probably a better word to use. Right. Uh-huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's what she means. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Any more questions, folks? Go ahead and type in your questions at the top right of the screen so we can, we can, we can take care of them. This is all fascinating information. I, I had no idea you could actually work your vagus nerve by by uh, working on the feet. Oh yes, I've done it regularly. You can be sure that if anybody's got acid reflux, the vagus nerve is blocked. Huh. Absolutely sure on the foot. Yes. Okay. I, well. I, I'm, I'm I'm going to pick up the chart that you sent me again. I'm going to look for the vagus nerve here because I don't recall seeing the vagus nerve. Okay, let's see now. Why don't you show us on the slide as well so we can see? Yeah, this is what I'm going to look for now. I'm going to see if I can see the slide. The chart. Um. I need a chart that's telling me. Uh, that's tell him it's showing my slide and then I will show you where it is. Okay. What are the factors? What can we do? Yeah, I'm looking at it here. Nerves, pelvic muscles. It may be missing it. Yes, I can show it to you. I can say if I was to show you the uh, relaxation part, if I could uh -huh. show you the relaxation, uh, uh, the the diaphragm on the solar plexus is what I'm giving. Here you go. Here you oh, go. There it is. I, I there it. Is. Right. Right. Now then. Um, right. Uh, here you go. Right there. There's your vagus nerve. Down there. On the, the inside of the big foot, or the outside. On the foot. side, from the bottom of the large toe down to the base of the toe. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. There and there, and you can be almost certain that anybody with digestive problems will have a block around there. Mm. And there. Mm. And what you it's do is like it's a, I beg your pardon. What you do is that you, 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 you just put a little pressure on that side for a while or do you Well, I, I finger walk it. I finger or thumb walk it down. 
and then uh -huh. where there's a block in the energy of, of, of a block in that area, I'll stay there until there's a change. It's a little bit like somebody, if, if people are familiar with the acupuncture, the needles go in on the spot and then when there's a balance, the needles are willing to pop out. And I can do the same thing with my fingers. And I go down that vagus nerve, feel where there's a block, stay there until it's changed. But I will also not only do that, but I will also come down and up in this area here. See? Not there. I'll be working this completely because that's the esophagus. Mm. And you're going to feel uh, that you're going to feel it there too. And sometimes there's a large burp, which is what I'm looking for too. But it definitely can bring help to the digestive system because that's what's been affected. Very interesting. Okay, someone wants to know what is a good source of, in parentheses, she writes a book, to learn how to do this for ourselves. Now, you did say it's possible to perform. I, I don't know how well you'll be able to do it on yourself, but is it possible to do that on yourself? Oh, yeah. It, 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 to, to help oneself, you mean, to work reflexology on oneself? It is possible. It's obviously better for someone else to do it, but it's certainly possible to do it to yourself. It's learning where the places are on the foot and, and being guided by it. And the way that they would be able to do it would be to touch the place on the chart, on the foot, where the chart directs them to. And they would be able to feel that that part of their foot is hurting. If your foot is hurting, your body's hurting. Your feet just don't hurt. Your body's hurting when your feet are hurting. If we're look, we're look, I'm looking at this chart, and every part of your body is on that chart, every part of you. And so if you've got a pain, and some people will tell me they've got a pain, they get out of the shower, and every day there's a pain here, pain here, right, right there, in the solar plexus. They don't know it's the solar plexus, but you can be certain that that's what's happened. And then you work it, and you'll work the diaphragm like I from there to there, okay? And so uh, you can work that and, and hold the solar plexus or hold any part of one's foot until it stops hurting. But you don't have to press it hard. You know, I don't shout at the body, I whisper to it. So I don't shout at the body, I just whisper to the body. You, there is no need to press hard so that you're hurting, you just literally touch the spot, wait for it to release, and then there will be a better, the person will feel better immediately, sometimes, almost immediately. Sometimes it depends, and if it's chronic, it will take a lot longer. Okay. Just, just one of those situations, but there may be an opportunity for me to get something like a little program written up for people that would like to learn to do it for themselves. That might be good good idea. If people write in to me and tell me that's what they'd like, I can put something together so that they could use it at home because maybe they don't find they've got a reflexologist in their area or someone that they can turn to. But they could do it as a family together and if I have enough people asking me to put a program together and showing them with charts, I'd be happy to do that. That would be helpful. Can you give us your email address again, please? I beg your pardon? Um, could you um, say out your email address again, just so people can contact you? Sure. Yeah. It's, shall I change it to the, OK. It's www.derwin, D-E-R-W-E-N, therapies, all one word, T-H-E-R-A-P-I-E-S, derwintherapies.com. That's my, oh, that's my website. My email address is Patricia at derwintherapies.com, D-E-R-W-E-N, therapies, T-H-E-R-A-P-I-E-S, therapies, all one word, dot com. And I'd be happy to put a program together, and it would be a fun thing to do, and it would help an enormous amount of people 
who would like to do this work at home if they, you know, some people are not able to get out as easily as others are. Right. Some people live a, a, a distance away from a person that could do reflexology. There's lots right. of people that would appreciate a thing like that. I think that would be an absolutely wonderful idea, and I'd be happy to do it. If enough people ask me, I would do it. Okay, you, you heard it, folks. <laughs> Start asking. <laughs> what a giving woman you are, Patricia. That's, that's, I'm sure that is. Thank you. That would be very helpful. All right, someone is asking, well, how about hand reflexology? Isn't that easier to work on for oneself? Absolutely. That would be a wonderful idea, yes, to do the hand and to work through the hand. Now, here's how to do that. I, I can send a chart. I have a chart that I could send, but um, it's not my personal chart, but I do have a chart. My personal chart is in the making. Um, but when you work over the hands and you feel the sensitivity in an area on the hand, that would definitely work. Now, when we're doing the vagus nerve, Think about the thumb, think about the thumb, and the thumb, the front part of the thumb where the nail is, okay, all you have to do is go down the outer part of your thumb there, the vagus nerve. At the base of your thumb, where we have this area right here, with the thyroid and the parathyroid, that's where you would find the thyroid and the parathyroid on your hand. This, and then the top of the thumb inside, you would find the pituitary just right there, just exactly what it is on the foot. And you can do the same thing with the hypothalamus. You can do exactly the same thing because um, the hypothalamus will be here, right there, before the top of the vagus nerve. I'm going to change the color. So it would be very useful for people to be able to do that with their hand. Absolutely would. More convenient in many occasions, you know. Mm. OK, great. Well, I think that covers it for tonight. Um, let me check again. OK, a few comments here. That does it, pretty much. Thank you so much again, Patricia. I mean, we, 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 we certainly need to talk about a couple of some more, I mean, as uh, many as, as you can uh, to, to help uh, educate people as, as we go along. But I'm sure we'll be talking about that as we go along. So uh, appreciate it. Anything else you wanted to share before we end the webinar tonight? Well, I just hope that the material has been helpful and brought some more a realization to people how much stress affects their bodies and how much they're going to look after themselves when they're in stressful situations and some of the things that can be done. So hopefully it's uh, a, a, some education as to what they didn't know ahead of time. That would be my privilege if I've given somebody some understanding of it. Well, I, I, I really believe you have increased our help to increase our understanding about the dangers of stress and what, what can be done and, and to minim, minimize the, the bad effects of stress, of stress on our bodies. Right, right. I believe you have. Good. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, and we appreciate it. All You're right, well... We'll, we'll wrap it up tonight, and uh, God bless. Have a great evening, everyone, and be sure to be on. Oh, yes, I did kind of like, I did mention that uh, a couple of things. Uh, uh, there's a presentation on the seven laws of life tomorrow, and uh, Dr. Anibadi's DVDs are available for sale on his site, so uh, on our site. So be sure to, to get his, his DVD if you are concerned about ADD or you have a family, if you have a family member who is or who has the condition. All right, have a good night, Carl.